Welcome to Business is Unusual. This is Zaisla, and I am here today with Leslie Liu, and welcome to the show. I'm so fired up. Thank you for having me. I am so excited. I, Leslie is a newer um, acquaintance, but it's been really neat just to learn a little bit about her journey, and I'm really excited to have a chance for you all to hear about it. it before we get into the business side of things, what is a hobby of yours that you think would surprise folks? I don't think that there's a hobby that pe that would surprise people because I'm pretty much an open book for my friends. So when I flat out say karaoke is a hobby mm -hmm. of not being a skilled singer at all, but just loving the unapologetic freedom of it mm -hmm. is, is probably one of the things that sticks out most for me. Karaoke, I feel like that tells us a lot about who you are in terms of boy, spontaneity. Not, you're not afraid to, not trying to look perfect and good all the time. Community. These are Community all. Building. And I even, one of my proposals for 2024, I kid you not, was healing our inner child through karaoke and play. Hmm. And that sounds like an introvert's nightmare, but there, that there is something powerful because I guarantee you that there is a song that takes you back to a moment in time or a memory or something. And there is something about helping people somatically release that through karaoke. Mm -hmm. And I just tell people it's not about perfection. It really is just about freedom, <laughs> letting your heart out. So I love to facilitate that. Yeah. And playfulness. Yeah I, can, yeah, I can imagine that. And well, I think that's a great way to segue into tell folks just a little bit about your business, it's short description, type of work name, that kind of thing, and then we'll get more and more into what it is. Yeah. So I'm the founder of Reclaiming Your Courage. And essentially what I do is I help people escape bad situations using their mind, body, and voice. And what that really means is that I developed a holistic approach to self-defense because that's the unusual part of this is that I'm not here to advocate for eye pokes and groin kicks. It's so much more than that. It's, the, it's about standing in your power, self-advocacy, community, love, and courage. Wow. That, I can't wait to dig more into that. That sounds incredibly powerful. It, what does success look like to you? Success to me is philosophically how I believe when I identify as a trailblazing entrepreneur. Trailblazer meaning is that you go on a path that nobody else wants to go on. When everyone's going left, you go right. You forge a path by pouring gasoline over the pathway, lighting it on fire. And once you find that roadmap to success, I think it's so important to reach out your hand to someone else. And I believe that success is collaboration and collective healing. So I almost don't feel like success is mine per se as a procession, like a possession. I believe that we build legacy by helping generations that come before us and to really just show our humanity to other people. And I think the best way to do that is to share and that we all could succeed together. I'm here for it. There is a was it there's the Lee Iacocca quote, quote or something it's like not I haven't won unless other people lose or something and I long ago reframed that for myself as I haven't won unless other people also win that is because I don't think it has to be either or right. most of the time it, it doesn't feel can, real if you right? can't experience it with others and share stories with them Right. And it's like you said, share that opportunity or awareness or connection. I love that. Yeah. I'm here for it. Yes. It's, so in terms of success, so, you know, that sharing, I feel like you answered this a little bit, but how would you see that affecting the industry that you're in, the type of work that you do? Like, would you see it as transforming something about how that that exists? Absolutely. Like I, I, I would say that it's literally taking a bat and smashing the industry that I'm in. And what I mean by that is as someone who 
is a two-time black belt and who grew up in the martial arts world and self-defense world, right? There were no women role models for me most of my life, for one. Most of it, to be honest, were military dudes or dudes that written books that look like Chuck Norris and dudes that would be yelling at me. And what I started realizing really quickly was that nobody really looked like me. And what I mean by that is as a woman of color, as a woman of color and mm -hmm. me having trauma that I was working through as someone who's been sexually assaulted at a young age, who has experienced microaggressions in the workplace, I had all this internal rage and I had all of this going on inside of me and there was really no room in the self-defense world to really process that. And so what really birthed my company is understanding that there was this piece around helping women, those that identified not just with what everyone else was identifying, right? So whether you identified as queer, neurodivergent, disabled, no one was really holding space and asking these questions of how does the way that you identify intersect with the way that potential attackers perceive you, right? And so I'm going to put it mm -hmm. out there. I'm an Asian woman. So the perception is that I'm submissive and I'm not vocal and that I carry a lot of cash and that I'm hypersexualized, right? So those are stereotypes that exist. Mm -hmm. And so that makes me more prone to a physical altercation on the street, right? And me paving the way in my industry is really saying, no, we should not just be focusing on technique, right? Punching and kicking and just the physical mm -hmm. stuff. We have to help people with their self-belief, their self-worth, to give them a framework for speaking up and really taking ownership of their voice. And then once we have those components, then the physical manifests. Like I don't do any physical work mm -hmm. with my clients. I actually spent a lot of time asking the deeper questions. Who are you? Who do you fight for? Before I really, really mm -hmm. teach them anything about physical protection. I feel that. I, I feel like it's very, it's a wise approach in that if you don't have this in yourself, it, it is harder. I, I would say be. I wouldn't say impossible, but I, I would say there are a lot of barriers between you and action and, and that uh, ability to get on. Like I know I can, I can reflect on times in my life when I have felt that sense of insecurity or uncertainty. And I'm, it's almost, I used to describe it as like I had the boot on my own neck and until I took it off, it didn't matter what right. anyone else was and doing. And so my question to you, if we were in a class would be, well, whose voice are you hearing right now? Yeah. Right. And so a big part of my work is creating safe spaces for communities and to build that trust and to have consent and co-creation around the workshops that I create so that people know that their voice matters and that they have a sin. Like, oh, you know, it's actually really important for me to process this trauma than get into anything physical and to prevent myself from being re-triggered. So once I started yeah. holding space for that, that's the power in kind of reclaiming your current and my business. And that's how I would say it's unusual because once I started doing it, I started pissing off a lot of men and people in the community who were like, hey, this is the way that we've done it. This is the way we should always do it. And I'm like, says who? And first of all, is there a reason why you're speaking over me? Like, I have two black belts. That's the equivalent of having two master's degrees, mm -hmm. right? But literally having the patriarch mm -hmm. tell, patriarchy tell me like, no, you have to teach this way. Mm -hmm. And so, no, screw yeah. that. I am, if you don't want me at your table, I'll just create another table. Okay, so we have to do. It, so this is a question that I, I'm trying to find a good way to ask, which is that there's something in you or in your life that set the stage for this, for you to see this need. And there's obviously lived experience. And yet, and while I, I could hear that your lived experience is definitely unique, I, I feel like there's always a little bit more to it because other people might have had those experiences. And yet for you, 
it created this motivation to action. And is there something you can point to or a story that you can share that illustrates what sort of unveiled that yeah, for you? It's a two parts of the story. Prior to the pandemic, I was teaching traditional self-defense at a MMA gym or a women's wellness center, right? So the stereotypical things that women expect, like, I'm going to go take a women's empowerment self-defense class for a weekend, right? And what I started noticing was that there were always a handful of women in the class that froze. And what I observed is that people kind of did that tough love thing of yelling at these women. Like, What's wrong with you? How come you can't thing or lack of mm -hmm. athleticism? And the reason why I have empathy for that is because when I was learning what they were learning, right, like what to do if a 200 pound man is mounted mm -hmm. on you or whatnot. I remember being in that exact moment and I thought, what would I need that those women need right now that I didn't have, right? And this is, comes from years mm -hmm. of overcoming being assaulted, being attacked on the street, um, being verbally harassed, being, having to deal with toxic family members and having physical altercations or whatever. Something in me was like, why aren't we taking more time and helping those women instead of just focusing on the women that had a high level of athleticism and rewarding them, right? Oh, yeah, like they're doing mm -hmm. great, right? And so yeah. I had a soft spot for the abandoned. That's how I call it is like, I'm the leader of the misfits. So if you're someone who just, you know, you run awkwardly, you don't feel like the most fit or whatever, I want you on my team. Because I believe that when you have the hmm. heart and I can help you with these pieces of mind, body, and voice, you are going to be 10 times more powerful than anybody in the room. And it's just a matter of me being patient and kind of giving you a structure to it. So that's the first part of the story. Fast forward to the start of the pandemic. Everyone's in quarantine. That president at that time made some remark about a community. And then we started seeing the spikes in anti-Asian hate crimes, 300%. And my breaking point yeah. was when the Atlanta spa shootings happened and six of the women that were murdered looked like my mom. They could have been my mom, right? And then shortly after that, you had inc yeah. incidences in New York City. Uh, Christina Yuna Lee, who literally was my age, someone who worked in tech. Um, getting pushed into the train tracks. This stuff was, hap was happening and just the rage I felt with the media sympathizing with the shooters and the attackers and the silent suffering kept me up at night, pissed me off. And that is what propelled my business when I said, there is no one else uh, and there's no one else who's an Asian woman leap effort hmm. right so i had to go against yeah. the grain and that wasn't always met with open arms but i was like there are the most vulnerable the elderly pregnant women right those who um those that were just most vulnerable and so that's when i was relentless in my pursuit of my business Ellen, um, yeah. And who, so you, you said this more in a general sense that, you know, that who kind of thrives with your service or that might, or who maybe you typically work with. Are there other aspects that you said the heart? And it sounds to me like also people who are willing to be vulnerable in that way, who understand that there is another aspect to learning about self-defense, or at least if they don't understand it, they're open to understanding it. Is there anything else that you could say would be sort of that typical person that could? And also, I I know you are, you started, you started in the pandemic, but you are located, I believe, in California. So is it something people can learn remotely? Yeah, is it great more question. Person? Thank you for all of that. I support people in person and virtually. I speak all over the globe. I have the opportunity to speak all over the world. I coach families virtually, especially families whose kids have been victimized and bullies, uh, bullied at school. 
Um, so I do that virtually. And then my Woman Warrior Uprising program, which is getting revamped, um, there's online curriculum. So people can digest what I'm teaching, how to like really embody your boundaries and how to handle pushback in conversations. So I will say that the range of people that I serve are whether you are the working professional that hits a ceiling in your, in your development, that you don't, you're put on the spot all the time, you don't know how to handle that pushback, or you don't know how to ne negotiate or advocate for higher pay, you're definitely someone I work with. If you are a parent of a kid who's neurodivergent, right, recently got diagnosed with ADHD, who's getting bullied at school and doesn't want to go to the traditional McDojo, I want to work with you because your kid doesn't want to go to McDojo because the kids that are bullying them go to McDojo. And a mm -hmm. big part of my work, too, with anti-bullying education is I work with schools to review their anti-bullying policies. And this week, actually, I helped a private Catholic school rewrite theirs and really define what that is and, you know, to really help on group and individual intervention. So I can come in there. And yeah, if you are the entrepreneur that really just has no idea, like if you really have limiting beliefs and fears around showing up as yourself and to speak confidently, I'm definitely that person that helps you hone in on your power and the things that ring true with all those three types of people or four types of people is that you've got to believe that you're worth fighting for, right? Like you have to understand what is the deeper fear. And what my work is really rooted in is understanding that empowerment comes when you realize that there's nobody coming to save you. You are not in need of a savior. Everything that you need and the resources you need is inside of you. So personal pain turning into power. And that is the best thing that I can offer to anyone, especially those who have been physically attacked, who try to, you know, I work with victims all the time, domestic violence, people who are trying to escape bad situations in their marriage or whatnot. And um, they don't feel like they have ownership. So they always seek help from outside. And then there's the disappointment and hurt associated with no one came to help me. And I think that yeah. is what I'm here to do and what I've dedicated my life to is that I want you to remove the attachment to seeking something external to protect you. Thank you. So how does that show up? And in, in can you have a specific way that, and obviously without, I don't want to reveal any ways, but is there a, 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 an example that comes to mind that might, you gave several, I think, great summaries of examples. And if that's the place, feels the right place to land. Uh, but if there's anything that you can, you know, maybe flesh out or sketch out a little more so people can recognize sure. something in it. I'll give you an example. One of the women I worked with during the pandemic lived in New York City, and she had gone early afternoon, like 12 noon, downstairs from her high-rise, super luxurious condo to pick up her food delivery order. Uh, as soon as she picks it up, she goes into the elevator. She gets attacked. She reaches out to me and is clearly distraught, not by the fact that she has gotten assaulted in an elevator, but more so of the fact that she felt powerless and that she was screaming for help and that there were people present in the lobby that still didn't come to help her. It was more of the fixation of why didn't anybody do the right thing rather than yeah. the actual like realization of, oh, my God, you know, your privacy has been invaded. You've been physically brutalized. So I did a lot of work with her, with my framework and my system. And when we started peeling back these layers, I said, OK, well, 
whose voice are you hearing right now? And she's like, my mother's, because I was taught to be a Southern belle. I was taught to not be not ladylike. So to take that deeper, I was like, well, what did you really want to do that in that moment? She's like, I wanted to use my high heel. I wanted to scrape his face. I wanted to like use my nails and scratch through his skin. And so I asked, why didn't you? And it's because of this narrative she had of her mother saying, it's unladylike. So she much rather would have absorbed it and taken it all than appear to be not ladylike. Powerful stuff for me, right? Like it's not, so when I say it's much more than just self-defense, sure. Could I teach anybody how to get out of a wrist release or a chokehold? Yes. But for her, that wouldn't have served her. I spent, I've spent no, literally two months with her doing deep somatic grounding and breathing exercises and visually and writing as to what to help her find her strength. And that really did just start on, let's start off with, what did you want to say? She could not even tell the person to move away from her. She just stayed quiet and let it mm -hmm. happen. And I think that that is something that rings true for a lot of people. And even though that's an example of a physical attack, those themes translate over when I work with clients who, oh, Leslie, I don't feel physically unsafe. I'm fine. And I'm like, okay, but you do have an issue with your toxic family member who's attacking you yeah, am. and your weight for the holidays. So different scenario, right? But the same framework I take them through of what's going on for you right now. How do you mm -hmm. think this situation is going to play out? And let's make a strategy on how to build stronger boundaries around removing yourself and disengaging from the situation. Yeah, I, I really, really can't agree with that enough. I know that I remember a few years ago, probably seven much closer than I would like it to be, when I sort of realized that there were behaviors I tolerated that were harmful to me because I didn't want to hurt someone's feelings. <laughs> it's like, wow, I am prioritizing my perception of their feelings over my actual harm. That is so interesting and no longer acceptable to me. However, it was such an unconscious conditioning and so I really, what you're saying, like, absolutely, it was to be ladylike. And there were a bunch of ways in which I figured out how not to be. And yet uncovering it to that deeper place, I think, is a, is a very effective and full strategy. Because just because I, I, I uncovered it in the work world, that was fine. That I, For whatever reason, I made that work. But then in the personal world, I didn't have that same awareness, I guess. And so... That what you're talking about, really getting into it deeply so that it permeates to the whole of your being, I think that's ultimately going to be the most effective and genuinely necessary. Like we, in addition to our homes, we get conditioned every day. Well, thank you for culture. sharing that because that theme of having guilt or shame around that and being more worried about how our boundaries might be received, I've realized is something that transcends language. And demographic, right? Like you're you're experiencing that, but someone in India right now can probably listen to this and that resonates with them as well, right? In terms of the conditioning and the societal expectations. And that is something that I'm realizing too, that the more that I travel and focus on women who have experienced gender-based violence, they don't have that awareness. So just being able to role model and teach right? Like you could teach a workshop alone on like just self-awareness because I think it's remarkable that you acknowledged it and that you take, you took steps towards getting away from it. And my role is to help women who experience it, but may not know symptomatically what they're experiencing. It's really important. Like I said, I'm, I so love that you're doing this. I think it has a profound, there's a profound need for it. And yeah, definitely. My, I mean, I, for me personally, I see so much of the white supremacy is that because of the, the ways in which colonizers went around everywhere. Uh, thank you to my people. Sorry, guys. 
I, you know, and that's, that's the legacy. That's the legacy of the, the colonization is this conditioning. So it's, it's everywhere. And I don't think we combat it by being equally dominant. I think we combat it by community culture and connection and by not actually trying to combat it by showing that, like you said, building this other table, because that, that one's pretty Right. Shaky. And it takes a lot of courage for you here being an ally with me and saying, hey, this is rooted in white supremacy. And, and put it of of effects, you know, <laughs> right? And you having the courage yeah. to say, right? And and here I am also saying, yeah, it's if you have the luxury of not being impacted by systems of oppression, just know that is a luxury because you have a lot of communities that are underserved, feel pain, and have mental health issues that experience violence in their communities, and so. That's also what I like to shed a light on is that imagine having to deal with that and having to physically protect yourself, right? And all of that is a factor, gender identity as well, like helping same-sex couple. I, I've counseled on, on how to really protect their children, right? Because I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. There's a lot of fear around we're two moms. Right. And we've had a lot of hate speech you know, thrown at us. What can we do? How can we help our son or daughter at school have these conversations with kids about? And that's really where I come in is helping people with the assertive communication. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, um, would you be willing to share advice that you've received? That's, I think that the advice. I was given, I will attribute to my coach, right? The uh, amazing Chris Atkins, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily in the approach, right? Because I will say that distinctly nobody mm -hmm. approaches uh, self-defense in the way that I, or the work that I'm doing. So I haven't ever, any advice I've been given about that aspect of my business and how I carry it out, I basically didn't listen to. Because if I listened to it, I would have given up a long time ago. But um, yeah. I think that, Carissa gives me so many nuggets and she she's always advocated for me to just do what lights me up and to be unapologetic about it. And even when even before she was my coach, I asked her what would make how could I identify a great coach for me? And she's always been very clear that by investing in myself that that I was worth it and that but I didn't believe that at the time so self-investment is so important and self putting yourself first it's basically she's always been an advocate of not, me not neglecting myself or me dimming my light because I do come from people pleasing tendencies and cultural tendencies of showing respect and putting everybody else first but she has always been the advocate. You get to design your life. So I've always taken that. Mm -hmm. And that's why 2023 had me in the most explosive growth I've had in my health and my business is because of that. It's like she, it almost gave me permission to just let go of all of my inner critical voices and to just trust in my personal strength and passion. Yeah, I celebrate and that. I get to meet people like you, too, right? Like Fantastic. you and I, are, cool. I feel like we're friends too. But there is something energetically yeah. about two souls coming together. Like you and I don't really know each other, but energetically, right? Like you are helping me feel seen in a way, or being curious about my work in a way that I haven't felt in a lot of interviews, right? And that's a testament mm -hmm. to your personal work and to the space that you're creating here on your podcast. So I'm just really grateful. Thanks. That's really what I want. I'm, I feel like we have so much in our world that tells us that we're not enough, right? That we're doing the wrong thing because we're not trying to make every single cent off of every single person as our primary goal or that we're supposed to do it this other way, this right, that someone's going to sell it instead of really like, like you were saying, leaning in fully into who we are and our passion and 
I think a lot of us do have sort of a calling in life. And sometimes we get to do it for our work and sometimes we do it, you know, on the side. But there's something about being in that and being in that aliveness that brings, I think, so much more harmony and alignment to life. And it can f- indulgent. I, I don't know. That's not really true. Like when I'm in it, it doesn't. But when I'm walking towards it, sometimes I'm like, am I really going to do the thing that I want to do? It's not just eating candy all the time. It, it's not that kind of indulgent. It's it's this other thing that I know. It almost free. feels like a Philly cheesesteak to me. It's very dense. It's I'm living in my purpose. Mm-hmm. I get to. There's something <laughs> indulgent about it. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to put double meat and cheese on that today, right? Yeah. So I'm with you. I'm following that. And that's what I learned, too, in, in working and being part of the Alpha Queen Collective community is really just like, I get to. Right? I don't have to do yeah. what I don't want to. I get to live in my purpose. And that's the shift and what I embraced this year is like, I get to do this. I get to do this podcast with you. I get to mm-hmm. travel the world and speak to young girls and provide words to them that might move them to be more stronger than they were yesterday. So yeah, I'm super excited about everything rather than feeling so much pressure to be excellent at everything. I think that's the other thing that she always had mm-hmm. encouraged me is like, oh, you don't have to be, you'll figure it out. She always tells me like, you'll be okay. So something mm-hmm. in that when someone else sees your heart and yeah. someone is like, I see you. Like, mm-hmm. She literally lifted a building off of my shoulders and I just ran with it ever, ever since. Well, I mean, not carrying a building go a lot faster, right? (laughs) Her energy is contagious, right? Like she lights up any room that she walks into and she's not everybody's coach, but she's the right coach for me. And I. Yeah. No, exactly. You don't have to be everybody's. There's 8 billion people on the planet. That's what I tell my clients when I'm helping them with their business work. I'm like, look. You don't need that many people. Right, but everyone's going to, some people (laughs) legitimately get mad at me. Are you going to hold pads for me today? Right? You've been watching way too much Cobra Kai, right? So if you're someone who just wants to just go at it and and vent and hit some pads, I'm not your coach because what I'm trying to teach you is something so much more sustainable than just going to a class and feeling empowered Mm -hmm. for a weekend. And then what happens? You forget it all and you go back to fear. What I'm trying to do is put roots in the tree um, so that Mm -hmm. you can withstand the storm that comes and goes. Yeah, it is very different. And do something that is, you said, you you pour in the gasoline on that, that forge should fire away. My personal experience is there could be times when that can feel overwhelming or discouraging. And you have to like recenter or recharge or get re-inspired. Do you have a set of tactics or ways that you do that, that you go to? Yeah, it's really affirmations around failing forward and to just really going back to the commitment I have for myself. And so developing the practices around meditation and spiritual guidance around what's my personal manifesto, right? Um, Which is something that I worked on in the group, right? And that being my compass, right? It's going back to spiritual practice and going back to my writing and speaking to my higher self. I know that sounds woo-woo for some people, but I, for me, um, that was such an important part when I was working with a somatic um, writing coach a few years when I was working on a memoir. That was my first introduction into speaking to higher self and having a vision of myself in the future. So, I don't know. I talked to her. So that's kind of my guiding principle is like when I feel like it's overwhelming and it's not enough, like I definitely know now to slow the F down. Whereas before I would try to just mm. go. And the thing that always stuck out with, for me with Carissa is go get 10 no's, hurry up and go get 10 no's. And what she was really teaching me Mm. was just a level of resilience and built up my confidence so much. So now in my mind, I only need one yes. I don't need 10 yeses. I just need one to be aligned with the right people and the right Mm. client. Yeah. 
It's facts. So folks that are listening and they want to learn more, follow you, get in touch, hire you, what's the best way for them to You to can find me up? on the Insta and all my cool videos and reels and helpful tips and tricks at Reclaiming nice. Your Courage. That's one word. And then on Facebook, Leslie Liu, her last name's L-E-W. I'd love to hear if any of this resonated with you. And also my website, reclaimingyourcourage.com. Um, the best thing for people to do is really just subscribe to my um, community. And then you, you get the firsthand, like, the things that I'm rolling out, which is very exciting, which is my new Woman Warrior Uprising program. So that's when you get access to the online curriculum, to things like international retreat that I host um, and other VIP experiences and kind of, you know, where I'm at in the city near you. So yeah, that's how anybody can engage with my work. Lovely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining awesome. me today. Thank you so much. Bye everybody.